Well, hello, everybody. It's my pleasure to be here today with Lee Knowles Matier, local Poles Bow artist, makes beautiful lino cuts and has a wonderful studio where she teaches out of and shares with other artists as well. Uh, my name is Deborah Rosinski. I'm executive director of Bainbridge Arts and Crafts, and it's it's my pleasure to speak with Lee today. Um, I noticed in going through some of your background, uh, it looks like you and I were in Southern California in, in a similar time frame. You at USC for undergrad, me at UCLA for undergrad. You're a couple of years ahead of me, but <laughs> close in timing. Um, and then you went, um, and that was for printmaking, right, at USC? Mm -hmm. UCLA. And then at Arizona State later for an MFA? Yeah. Ten years later, actually. Ah. Uh, I did a lot of teaching in between. Uh -huh. That's great. And um, it sounds like you've had a thriving studio practice since the early 1980s, about 1981, mm -hmm. uh, teaching and making work. And uh, your primary technique is linocut, right? Um, well, when it started off, actually, the primary techniques were lithography and etching. When I was at USC, I had a wonderful professor, mentor named Ruth Weisberg. And she was a consummate uh, draftsman, <laughs> wonderful figure drawer, very inspirational. And she created beautiful lith lithographs. I had never heard of printmaking before. So uh, the whole physical process of graining down a stone, applying an image in grease, treating it chemically, uh, removing the grease, rolling up with ink, running it through the press, um, and then working with the chemistry after that, it, it really intrigued me. And um, I love drawing. Drawing is probably my first love. Uh, but I, I quickly fell in love with printmaking after that. So yeah. as an undergrad. She must have been a wonderful teacher. I've loved her work for years. And, and, and still is, I believe. She's oh, still great. active, inspiring people. Mm -hmm. um, and did you seek out certain teachers at Arizona State later? Is that what I made it? I chose Arizona State University because they had a five deep faculty in printmaking. Oh, wow. They also had a print research facility. And that was very uh, encouraging to me. Uh, I went from a small private school ish, you know, U University of Southern California isn't that small, but. Uh, but Arizona State University is much bigger. And so the the graduate programs could afford to be more lush. Hmm. And we did everything from typeset, screen print, lino. Actually, I didn't do lino cut there. Um, monotype and lino cut, which I primarily do now, wasn't really a thing. Uh, mostly it was etching and lithography. Uh, and those are wonderful processes. I love them. Uh, I still love them. I still practice them, but they are more chemically intensive. Mm -hmm. And in my own studio, uh, because I had such a heavy teaching schedule, I really went back to a more simple format, which, or I should say media, which is that the, the physical and direct application of a tool into a substrate like lino cut. Mm -hmm. or a brayer loaded with ink straight on a sheet of plastic, pushing color around uh, for monotypes. Mm -hmm. um, and it doesn't mean that I don't still do litho, but it, I need to do a different setup if I'm going to pick that up again, um, just because of the nature of it. So the chemicals and the ventilation and that kind of thing? Um, and the whole... Uh, process. I have a large um, uh, litho press, but getting the stones, graining sinks, mm -hmm. um, all that stuff. Actually, I have to say, Jeff Sippel, um, he taught at the Tamron Printing Institute, uh, did a lot to develop non-toxic methods, as well as other artists and professors. So you don't have to go the toxic route. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just you know, part of the problem is people really weren't understanding additions. And people would ask me, well, is this a print? I'd say yes. And they'd say, well, you must have a large machine in your office. 
you know, and so there's this half of what I do is try to educate people about what a print is. You know, it's a multiple original. And that's hard to get your head around because an original is a painting, a sculpture, something that can't be replicated. Uh, with printmaking, you can create an addition if you have a substrate. Uh, monotype, not the same thing because there's no substrate. There's no grooves or pock marks or raised and lowered surfaces. Mm -hmm. uh, so you really only get one. So it really functions more like a, a painting in that sense. Mm -hmm. But I think after I've got drawers and drawers and drawers of editions of litho lithographs and etchings, and I still have drawers and drawers. You know, <laughs> and the thing is, at the time back then, um, editions of prints were were really important, and print documentation was really important. Now it's just doesn't seem like much anymore. I don't know; it might come back. What do you think caused that change? Um, probably advances in technology, probably offset litho. A lot of artists went to offset litho. So the idea of an addition, if the addition was large, 300 pieces, um, it sort of lost a value. Mm. And I don't know that people were interested in buying one of many. I think they started to become interested in buying one of one. Mm. At least that's my impression. I hope somebody sets me straight. Can you tell us about the um, printing presses behind you a little bit? Well, the, I have four printing presses. Um, two are not in the video here. A lithography press and three etching presses. Etching presses are like this Griffin press behind you, which we recently found. I went on a hunt to find a big press recently because now I'm doing these larger lino cuts. Mm -hmm. I think one is featured in the show. It's called Home. Mm -hmm. And these are three by three footers. And the way these got started was that I participated in an event called Ways Goose Kits Out, and mm -hmm. they did steamroller printing. Oh, and that's so fun. Linoleum <laughs> three by three, and that was the first time I had done that. And it was so much fun. Oh my gosh. Just having this big space and really being able to use your body, and, and it was like dancing. You know, you, you it wasn't, it wasn't this, it was, big marks and flowing and ah, it was great. Anyway. That piece of paper out on the pavement and the steamroller rolls over it. Is that right? And everybody goes, woo, you know. It's, it's... <laughs> anyway, um, I went on a hunt for a press and I saw this wonderful, I'd been wanting a Griffin for a long time. This is a nice mid-sized press. I can do most of my work on it. And it's the counterweight is so perfect and it just smooth as butter. And she's beautiful, <laughs> my, my love there. And in the process, I also found this Glenn Alps. I don't know if you know much about Glenn Alps. He taught printmaking at University of Washington. Mm. And he was a wonderful innovator. Uh, uh, all sorts of different things. Uh, rollers, shape certain sizes, collar type. Um, mm. And he built presses. So this is one of the presses he built. This is the Glenn Alps 104. And I found this in Bremerton and various <laughs> artists, including, uh, I think it was in the basement of CVG for a while. Um, anyway, I, it's a great legacy. So we tore it apart, restored it, put it back together. And now this is the one that I use for doing larger pieces. And um, CVG's Collective Visions Gallery, is that right? Collective Visions Gallery. So this is the size of a lineup. Oh, Wow. <laughs> piece that I'm working on one of seven uh -huh. this is going to be panel number three and uh, when I'm done with it I'll have 21 lineal feet of lino crap wow one of these days <laughs> so maybe <laughs> it's a process wonderful now you sh you share your studio is I do I have a a friend named Robin Weiss, he's a wonderful plein air painter. Uh, and he has the studio just on that side and down the steps, as well as another studio. But mostly he's out with his backpack. Hills, plains, valleys. They're in Colorado right now, painting up a storm. So it's nice to share because, 
you know, it's still two dimensional work, but he and I ask each other all the time, am I doing this right? <laughs> Makes sense. What do I need? I can't see. I need help. I need extra eyes. Um, and so it's a wonderful relationship because we don't do the same thing, but it's similar enough. Mm -hmm. Our media isn't the same, so I can't direct drive the way he can, but we can still inform each other. Well, I, I'm really impressed by the line work in your pieces in particular. I was looking at this piece, Augusta Savage behind me and, and the way you're using line to set off her face and the details and, and when you came in the other day, you were telling me more about her. It makes me want to learn a lot more. Um, an artist who maybe wasn't as well known, but influenced others like Jacob Lawrence and set up her own school. Uh, she sounds like an amazing woman. Tell me what inspired you about her story. Well, this started again as a Waste Goose project. I got together, uh, we have a little group called West Sound Printmakers. Uh, most of the folks are in Bremerton. And we took on a challenge with Waze Goose. The title was Invisible. And together we decided to choose women artists who through the years have either been invisible or become invisible. So each one of us chose an artist and my choice was Augusta Savage. Uh, for one thing, I was very attracted to her sculpture uh, and her tenacity. If anything, she had to be tenacious. And she's gifted and talented and she never had an easy road, even from childhood. And I included her story in the print documentation, some of her story, but I would certainly encourage people to look her up. And yes, later in life, she uh, developed a school um, it, as part of that Harlem Renaissance. And Jacob Lawrence and Gwendolyn Knight, I believe both went to her school. And of course, they were together and came here together and both wonderful and marvelous artists in their own right. You know, we don't know a lot about women artists. We know more now than we did. Uh, and I think really understanding all artists, no matter what their background or, uh, you know, where they're from, what their life story is, each artist contributes at a certain level. I don't really think anything comes out of a vacuum. When I was in Germany, I ended up in this little Gothic cathedral. Gothic? Romanesque? Anyway, I think Gothic, early Gothic. And there were wooden sculptures of life-size people that were absolutely extraordinary, absolutely mm -hmm. lifelike. Expressions, the whole nine yards. Um, and I was astounded and I thought, you know, through history, how many times you see things in tandem. You have abstraction and reality going at the same time. Same thing happened in Egyptian work. Um, and I think about artists that blaze the trail and artists that blaze the trail for them. So what was going on in Augusta's lifetime that fueled her? What, how, why did she end up in France? Uh, you know, there's so many parts and pieces to any artist's story, any person's story. And I think it's absolutely fascinating. The more I read about her, the more intrigued I was. I know I, I went around the bush and came back, I hope. <laughs> That's all good. And it makes me want to ask you how you wound up in the Pacific Northwest. Oh, um, after I got out of USC in 1981, a friend of mine uh, was visiting uh, a sister up here. So we came in and looked around. I think she was living in Ballard. And uh, it rained the entire week. <laughs> I, my mother still remembers me calling her, Mom, it's been raining for an entire week. And there's these cute little slugs going across the street. <laughs> it reminds me, my 91-year-old mother still reminds me, if I complain about slugs, well, you know, you remember. They were cute at one time. <laughs> I fell in love with the area. So when I got out of school, I moved up here and did odd jobs like everybody. Ended up working actually in Stone Press Editions with Kent Lovelace downtown on uh, First and Yesler or close enough. And, and that kind of kept me close. 
to lithography to printmaking, got a chance to meet. Um, actually, I got a chance to meet Jacob Lawrence. I didn't oh, even wow. know who he was. <laughs> I did brought some work and he was such a gentleman, such a wonderful, wonderful person. I how do you describe that? Um also Dan Smith came in with experimental inks. Oh into can to Kent and say, let's try this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's just fun. Anyway. So I I really okay, of course, couldn't make a living as an artist. So I, my other love is teaching. So I went into teaching mm -hmm. and I taught probably third through 12th until after grad school. And then I went out to Bradley university and taught there and ran a print research facility called Cradle Oak Press. Mm. And that sort of brought things full circle. I met many artists. Uh, the idea was that I would train uh, people who might not even be printmakers. Uh, how to listen to a visiting artist, look at the work, uh, learn how to print the work in editions, and uh, and in, in exchange, they would receive a print. Hmm. And there are many memorable artists. Leonard Baskin was one of them. Uh, Ruth Weisberg. Hmm. Uh, Paula Sigler. Hmm. Um, many. And that was such a wonderful experience because it pushed my boundary. It pushed me to, if you're gonna teach something, you better know something. So, oh, well, theoretically. And uh, and so it was, I mean, there were many nights till four in the morning and cold pizza. Oh, wow. In the grad yeah. students and they really hung in there. It, it, was, uh, it was a three ring circus, but it was worth it. <laughs> but the best kind, right? <laughs> I want to ask you, um, I've got a piece behind me that's part of a series you did featuring tools. Yes. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about what inspired that series. Well, this is a funny thing. We just helped my parents move out of their home of 50 plus years and the basement was full of tools from my great grandfather, grandfather, my dad, and my husband who builds wooden boats and many, many other things. He has a whole gantry full of tools and I love tools. Tools tell story. Tools had hands and grease and fingerprints and dust and uh, they made things. And I think that there's something about making something even something big, something you live in or something you travel on. Uh, I hope we don't lose that enthusiasm and exploration, that sense of engineering. Uh, anyone can, you know, it's, it's uh, dialed back not that long ago. Uh, we have a friend whose uh, father worked on a bridge, understood the mechanics, understood the engineering, help solve problems. And before you know it, he's an engineer. Never went to school. Hmm. And I think all our families have stories like that. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the tools, that particular hammer, uh, probably belonged to my grandfather in Ohio. My dad was born in 1928. Uh, when the depression happened, Stanley issued a, a less expensive line of tools for farmers. And it was in Defi Defiance, Ohio. And I think my dad brought this hammer out with him from Defiance because I found it in my dad's, um, in my parents' basement. And so that's my hammer. And it does most of the jobs I need to do. And then it went missing one day and I found it in my husband's shop. And I <laughs> took it back and I wrote on it, this is Lee's hammer on one side of the handle, and you flip the handle over, it says, not Jim's. <laughs> but and the truth is, you know, you think about, I mean, my grandfather built his house with that hammer. Well, one of the houses. Um, and I feel like 
it's a it's a it's a funny thing. It's this object you can hold in your hand. You can use it, uh, and it it has history and identity, and I suppose romance to a certain degree. Um, but I think it reminds me of a time in our history that was more industrious on a private level. We didn't wait for somebody to come do something for us or to us. We, we, I don't know if we were less afraid back then. I don't know. But to me, it's significant. It's, uh, it's a touch with humanity. It's a touch with our roots. It's a touch with migration and immigration. Uh, one of the tools I did is a plane that came from uh, Rutledge, Birmingham. It was the Rutledge Company in Birmingham, England. And my great grandfather uh, grew up in a coal mine situation. His own father had died in the coal mine. So his mother said, you're not going down there. So he went into uh, carpentry and he married my great grandmother who was an indentured servant. Hmm. And uh, together they, they had my grandfather in England and then they took passage to Canada and my great grandfather worked on the different hotels across Canada on the rail along the rail line and finally ended up at the Empress Hotel. <laughs> and that's the last leg of the journey. And that's where my great that's where my grandfather uh, I think he was the last graduating class from that two room schoolhouse there, which is still there. <laughs> they may turn it into a historic thing, I don't know, but so long story short, um, it's a fascination. And now I have a collection of tools you would not believe. Friends of friends of friends are bringing me tools. So the next thing is an egg beater. Mm -hmm. I want to do a series of kitchen tools. Um, and so one, one kitchen tool I have is from the 1800s, one from the 1930s. I'm not so interested in things that are more uh, modern. I'm really interested in things that are sort of from the depression and earlier. But if I live long enough, you never know. <laughs> well, we have the egg beater drill piece you did. It's and funny enough, the way that got titled, a lot of women were working with those drill presses during the war. And I, I found an article, it's just horrible, really. I mean, not in context, when it was written, it, it was fine, but it says, this drill operates like an egg beater. Even a woman can do this. Of course, if you really hold the drill, it's about that big and it weighs a ton. <laughs> Rosie the Riveter, I used to think, why did they give her such, well, you know, now I know. Uh -huh. I'm sure that was true. Yeah. <laughs> Things were made more substantially in the past. <laughs> no carbon fiber. Right, right. <laughs> Well, this has been a great conversation and a little insight into who you are and what you bring to the work that you do. And we're excited to show your work alongside uh, Gina Fruin Ceramics and Judith Ames and Hank Holzer woodworking pieces. Uh, so it'll be great once the show is all set up and uh, we can celebrate the, the conversations that'll happen with all, all that different work in the same space. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for inviting me and for sharing this time with me in my studio. It's very exciting. Thank you, Lee. Thank you for taking the time. We hope you'll stop in to visit our latest exhibition featuring Judith Ames, Hank Holzer, Gina Fruin, and Lee Knowles-Metier. It's on view until July 30th.